But the latest, and perhaps really, next to Mexico in the jazz high, I'll tell in a minute, best vision, also on high, but under entirely different circumstances, was the vision I had of Neil as he showed me one afternoon in January on the sidewalks of Workaday San Francisco, just like Workaday Afternoon on Moody Street in Lowell, when boyhood buddy funny guy G.J. and I played zombie piggybacks in mill employment offices and workmen's saloons. The Silver Star it was. And what and how the Three Stooges are like when they go staggering and knocking one another down the street. Mo, Curly, who's actually the ball-domed one, Big Husky. And meaningless goof, uh, though somewhat mysterious as though he was a saint in disguise, can't remember his name, a masquerading uh, super-duper witch doctor with good intentions, actually. Can't think of his name. Neil knows his name, the bushy, feathery-haired one. And Neil was supposed to be looking after his work. We just blasted a pint in the car as we drove down the hill into wild mid-market traffic and out third past the little Harlem, where two and a half years ago we jumped with the wild tenor cats and Freddy and the rest. I dig the little Harlem in rainy midnights coming home from work in the black slouch hat from the corner, the pale, pretty pink neons, the modernistic front, the puddles so rosy glowing at the foot of the entrance, the long, arrowing, deserted Folsom Street, which, as I hadn't remembered in my back east reveries, run straight into the far lights of the Mission or Richmond or whatever district, all glitters in the indigo distance of the night, to make you think of trucks and long halls to pass a Robles, Bleak Obispo or Monterey, or Fresno in the mist of highways, the ones with an end which is water orients and the empurpled Golgothian panoplies of Pacific Bowl and Abyss, past the dingy bars with their incredible names, colored bars like Moonlight in Colorado, that's one actually in Fillmore, or Blue Midnight or pink glass, and inside it's all wretched raw brown whiskey and mauve boilermakers. Past Mission Street earlier, too, before Folsom, with his corner conglomerate of bums, or sometimes lines of dragged winos so torpid that when pretty women pass, they don't even look, even though they're waiting in line to give blood for four dollars at Cutters, so they can cut off and buy wine and brandy for the Embarcadero night. If they do look, it's accidental. And they seem to be too guilty to look at ordinary women, only steamboat annies of pier-front bouges with knots in their sticks for calf muscles and hagless tooth marks in their purply gums. Yes, it's crap! Bums of Mission and Howard that live in miserable flop hotels like the Skylark in Denver. That Neil and his father, old Neil Pomeray the tinsmith, lived in and from which they took their Sunday afternoon walks together hand in hand and amiable after the previous Saturday night's hassles over the his over-drinking wine and a ceremonial saved-up evening movie. So he'd snore at usher close-up time, and lights on in the showhouse would reveal to shuffling audiences of whole Mexican and Arky families the sight of one of their fellow Americans a bit under the weather in a seat. This being the capper to a whole day of Saturday joys for little Neil, such as reading The Count of Monte Cristo while his father worked in the busy weekend morning, clean up at the Skylark, and a regular good meal in a fairly good restaurant in late afternoon. Then maybe a moment's lingering with the majority of non-celebrating Saturday night bums wrangled around in seated positions in the sitting room the longer winter nights of which Neil endured aiming spitballs at plaster targets and at celestial ceiling cracks as big old clock talkity talked the genuaries away and like in a movie the calendars flapped and still the land and the man survived stood fixed and immovable in a blur flap of white pages representing time. Usually the man was Neil's dad, the land, Colorado, the occasion and occupation, hope, good boy hope for a change. But now it's May, and they're going to a show and saying good evening to the bums who sit in state over this old thing, just like French sewing sisters in the provincial town. May. And Larimer Street is hum-buzzing with that same excitement, that same countryfied, wrangly, sad toot and tinkle of old mainland shopping streets in Charleston, West Virginia, with all its spotted farmer cars ranged and the canoa flowing, and the southern railroad town with moils of activity as sun-tortured five and tens, across from the tracks, awnings, nations of Negroes lounging by beater stores in near the tobacco warehouses flashing aluminum lights in the southern day fire. And Los Angeles, when the parade goes up and down both sides and the cracked old crazy John Gaunt from a rackety house in the Telegraph Grove outside the Bakersfield Flats with his entire brood of nine packed and pushed up 
to the torn flat bass black tarpaulin roof of his fantastic ancient 1929 touring imperial buick with the wooden spokes two of them cracked in a side rack for spares like a snail's shell goof on the running board old john gaunt and ma gaunt with her overalls in sorrow has to wait while paul gets his fill at the shooting gallery at south main two blocks from sister mata parks it's May, and little Neil and old man go cutting together into the adventures of a hard one evening, and one which, of course, like all life, is doomed to tragic, unnameable, to make you speechless and sad-faced forever death. Just as I used to hurry with my father, in May dusks of Saturday, towards unspeakable seashores with lights before them, and swooping spaces fit for gulls and cloud scuds, towards ramps of yellow sulfur lamplight, overdrives, sudden dank side alleys, when there came among the greases and irons and black dust of ramps and cobbled avenues like the avenues of factories in Germany, those secret chop sueys from Boston Chinatown to make my mouth water and my thoughts hasten to the wink of Chinese lanterns, hung in red doorways, at the base of golden tinsel port steps, leading up to the Mandarin secrets of within. So when Neil dreamed of being Christo thrown in the sea in a bag, I was kidnapped and shanghaied and orphaned to strange but friendly old Chinaman, who was my only contact with hopes of returning to my former life, orphaned in the interesting old void, eh? May night on Larima, when the sun is red on green storefronts and army-navy suits by the door, and makes a ray and a frazzle by an empty bottle, foot of a hydrant, he illuminates the reveries of an aged lady in the window above the windows of empty storerooms. She looks on wine coop, wazee in the rail. We passed Third Street and all that, and came driving slowly, noticing everything, talking everything, to the rail yards where we worked, and got out of the car to cross the warm, airy plazas of the day, and there particularly with a fine soot scent of coal and tide and oil and big works, a fly across haze oil shimmers, the tar soft under shoe, noticing how great the day and how in the experience of our lives together we were always finding ourselves in a golden, sleepy, good afternoon just like fishing. Well, really like the afternoons that must have been experienced by the noble son of his host, Nesta's friend, wild night charioteerings across the ghosts and white horses, a phallic classical fate in the gray plain to the sea, rewardful afternoons for tired winners, caresses of cups and figs in the lull of heroes, just like that, Neil and me. Only American, and Neil saying, Now, damn it, boy, you got to admit that we're high, and that was real good wine, and more instant and interesting, and always happening, and everything always all right. We sauntered thus. Come in the green clunker for some reason, wore our usual greasy bum clothes that put real bums to shame, but nobody with the power to reprimand and arrest us in his house began somehow talking about the Three Stooges. We're headed to see Mr. So-and-so in the office and on business, and around us, conductors, executives, commuters, consumers, rushed or sometimes just maybe ambling Russian spies carrying bombs and briefcases, and sometimes rag bags, I bet. Just foolishness. In the station there, the creamy stucco suggestive of palms like the Union Station in L.A., with its palms and mission arches and marbles, is so unlike a railroad station to an Easterner like myself used to old red brick and soot irons, exciting gloom fit for snows, and voyages across pine forests to the sea. Well, at that great station out there, I ran over to that ice that morning en route to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh, so unlike a railroad station, that I couldn't imagine anything good and adventurous coming from it. We, in our youth, had spent goof hours around railroad stations. In fact, the last time I was in Lowell, we staggered and laughed past the depot to the nearest bar and jumped and whooped over four-foot snow banks to boot, bareheaded and coatless. But here, nothing. Only bright California gloom and propriety. I suppose because Neil works for them there. Nothing but whiteness and everything busy. Officialists say Californian. No spitting. Uh, you know, you're at the carven arches of a great white temple of commercial travel in America. If you're going to blank your cigar, do it on the sly. And so on. But really, when it came into Neil's head to imitate the stagger of the stooges, and he did it wild, crazy, yelling in the sidewalk right there by the arches and by hurrying executives. I had a vision of him which at first, manifold it is, was swamped by the idea that this was one hell of a wild, unexpected twist in my suppositions about how he might now in his later years feel, 25, 
about his employers and their temple conventions. I saw his, again, rosy, flushing face exuding heat and joy, his eyes popping in the hard exercise of staggering, his whole frame of clothes capped by those terrible pants with six, seven holes in them, and streaked with baby food, ice cream, gasoline, ashes. I saw his whole life. I saw all the movies we'd ever been in. I saw for some reason he and his father on Larimer Street not carrying in May. Their Sunday afternoon walks, hand in hand in back of great baking soda factories, and along deadhead tracks and ramps, at the foot of that mighty red brick chimney a la Chirico or Chico Velasquez, throwing a huge long shadow across their path in the gravel and the flat. Supposing the Three Stooges were real. And so I saw them spring into being at the side of Neil in the street right there in front of the station. Curly, Moe, and Larry. That's his name, Larry. Moe, the leader. Mopish, Mowbray, Mope-mouthed, Mealy, Mad, Hanking, Making the others quake, Whacking Curly on the iron pate, Backhanding Larry, who wonders, Picking up a sledgehammer, Honk, and ramming it down nozzle first on the flat pan of Curly's skull. Boing! And all big dumb convict Curly does is muckle and yuckle and squeal, pressing his lips, shaking his old butt like jelly, nodding his jello fists, eyeing Mo who looks back and at him. Eyeing Mo who looks back at him and with that lord and surly. Ah, what are you gonna do about it? On the thunderstorm eyebrows like the eyebrows of Beethoven. Completely iron bound in surls. Larry, in his angelic, or rather, he really looks like he conned the other two, let him join the group. So they had to pay him all these years a regular share of the salary to them who worked so hard with the props. Larry, goof-haired, mopple-lipped, lisped, muxed, and completely flunk, trips over a pail of whitewash and falls face-first in the seven-inch nail that remains embedded in his eye bone. The eye bones connect to the shadow bone. Shadow bones connect to the luck bone. Luck bones connect to the foul bone. Foul bones connect to the high bone. High bones connect to the air bone. Air bones connect to the sky bone. Sky bones connect to the angel bone. Angel bones connect to the god bone. God bones connect to the bone bone. Mo yanks it out of his eye and pales him with an eight-foot steel rod. It gets worse and worse. It started on an innocent thumbing, which led to backhand, then the pastries, then the nose yanks. Flap, bloop, going, going, gong. And now as in a sticky dream set in syrup universe, they do muckle and moan and pull and mop about like I told you in an underground hell of their own invention. They are involved and alive. They go haggling down the street at each other's hair, socking, rem remonstrating, falling, getting up, flailing as the red sun sails. So, supposing the Three Stooges were real, and like Neil and me, we're going to work, only they forgot about that, and tragically mistaken and inter-allied, began pasting and cuffing each other at the employment office desk as clerks stare. Supposing in real gray day, and not the gray day of movies and all those afternoons we spent looking at them in hooky or officially on Sundays among the thousand crackling children of peanuts and candy in the dark show and the Three Stooges, as in that golden dream B movie of mine around the corner from the Strand, are providing scenes for wild vibrating hysterias as great as the hysterias of hipsters at jazz at the Philharmonics. Posing in real great day, you saw them, coming down 7th Street looking for jobs as ushers, insurance salesmen, that way. Then I saw the Three Stooges materialize on the sidewalk, their hair blowing in the wind of things. And Neil was with them, laughing and staggering in savage mimicry of them, and himself staggering and gooped, but they didn't notice. I followed and back. There was an afternoon when I found myself hung up in a strange city, maybe after hitchhiking and escaping something, half tears in my eyes, 19 or 20 worrying about my folks and killing time with a B-movie, or any movie, and suddenly the Three Stooges appeared, just the name, goofing on the screen, and in the streets they're the same streets as outside the theater, only they are photographed in Hollywood by serious crews like Joan Crawford in the fog, and the Three Stooges were bopping one another, until, as Neil says, they've been at it for so many years and a thousand and climactic efforts super-climbing and worked out every refinement of bopping one another so much that now, in the end, if it isn't already over... In the Baroque period of the Three Stooges, they are finally bopping mechanically and sometimes so hard it is impossible to bear, wince. But by now they've learned not only how to master the style of the blows, but the symbol and acceptance of them also, as though inured in their souls, and of course long ago in their bodies, 
to buffetings and crashings in the rixy gloom of thirties movies and B short subjects of that cracked kind that made me yawn at ten a.m. in my hooky movie of high school days. Intent I was on saving my energy to, for serious jawed features, which in my time was the cleft jaw of Gary Grant. Stooges don't feel the blows any more. Mo is iron. Curly's dead. Larry's gone. Off the rocker. Beyond hell and gone. So ably hidden by his uncombable mop, in which, as G.J. used to say, he hit a Derringer pistol. So there they are. Bonk, boing, and there's Neil following after them, stumbling and saying, Hey, look out! Hook! On Laramie or Main Street or Times Square in the mist as they parade erratically like crazy kids past the shoeboxes of simpletons and candy corn arcades. And seriously, Neil talking about him, telling me at the creamy station, under palms, the suggestions thereof, his huge rosy face bent over the time in a thing like a sun in the great day. So then I knew that long ago, when the mist was raw, Neil saw the Three Stooges. Maybe he just stood outside a pawn shop or hardware store or in that perennial pool hall door, but maybe more likely on the pavings of the city under tragic rainy telephone poles and thought of the Three Stooges suddenly realizing that life is strange and the Three Stooges do exist, that in 10,000 years that all the goofs he felt in him were justified in the outside world and he had nothing to reproach himself for. Bonk, boing, crash, skiddly boom, pow slam, bang, boom, wham, blam, crack, frap, kerplunk, clatter, clap, blap, fap, slap, map, splat, crunch, crouch, bong, splat, splat, bong.